I'm Professor Sally Spencer. I'm the Director of Clinical Research at the Postgraduate Medical Institute. and very pleased to welcome our panel this evening and all of you to this, what I think will be a very interesting event um, that will be hosted by the Postgraduate Medical Institute and the Institute for Creative Enterprise. Uh, Roger is the Director of ICE. Um, and welcome to the Faculty of Health and Social Care, our lovely location by the lake. Um, I don't believe there are any fire alarms due this evening, but if there are, just make your way to the exits. Um, I don't think um, I want to delay any more as we want to get into the evening, so at this point I'll just hand over to Roger um, and he'll introduce our panel. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Sally. I'm so pleased to see members of two different faculties on the campus here this evening, um, from the Faculty of Arts and Science and also from uh, the Faculty of Health and Social Care. Now, we've got four very interesting speakers this evening, and I'm just going to give them a, just a very um, warm and um, uh, picking up introduction. So on my far right, is uh, Joe Ainsworth. On my immediate right, Sharon Roberts. I've got Tim Wolford here on my left and Morris Spessman to his left. Uh, Joe Ainsworth is uh, a screenwriter and story consultant uh, for Holby City. He tells me that uh, he was the last of the 11 plus kids. He was educated by the Christian Brothers at St Mary's College in Crosby and uh, he had a degree from Edge Hill in English literature, so he's an alumnus from here. He has an honorary doctorate from the university, and he also has a building named after him on campus, <laughs> the, the Ainsworth Building, and student's apartment block. I'm, I'm colloquially, I'm known, it's not a colloquially known as <laughs> Joe's B&B. Uh, on my immediate right, as I said, is Sharon, Sharon Roberts, <laughs> Uh, also is an alumnus of the university and uh, she later completed her master's and is currently uh, doing a PhD and she is a lecturer um, in nursing at the university and we're so pleased to be able to bring uh, members of two different uh, professions here this evening. But on my immediate left is Professor Tim Wolford who is a consultant ear, nose and throat surgeon uh, has an international reputation for his particular um, profession. He is a specialist in nasal plastic and reconstructive surgery, and he's the current president of the ENT Facial Plastic Surgery Society. He's well known in the Northwest, having had posts in Manchester, also in Sheffield, and I think he's well known to this faculty as well. And on my far left is, is Morris Bessman, uh, in the information that went out for the, the event, uh, we had um, the series producer for Holby to come along. That was Kate Hall, who's a colleague of Joe's on the, on the programme. Kate yesterday had a severe eye injury and had to pull out at the last minute. So I'm delighted that in Morris we have a, a great uh, substitute because Morris is both a theatre writer and a screenwriter, he's written for Holby, Casualty, and Brookside, but he also is a registered and practicing nurse. At, um, he, called, he told me it's bank shifts, which means nothing to me, but maybe, <laughs> maybe does to those from um, this faculty. Uh, we will be looking at some clips of Holby during this session. There'll be an opportunity for uh, you to ask some questions a bit further down the line in this discussion. And uh, all the four panellists will be uh, commenting on uh, particularly Holby, but generally <coughs> medical dramas. Um, to kick off, I'd like to ask Joe to give us an insight into uh, how he um, prepares, develops, researches, and physically gets Holby uh, on our TV screens. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, we have... 
when you say me researching, we actually have a team of extremely good people researching in conjunction with uh, a team of uh, surgeons and uh, nurses in all working in hospitals. Uh, so, so basically we have an amazing resource of, of, of people from all different departments and at all levels uh, of, uh, of the NHS. So, so really my job is to scour the papers, uh, look for anything that sounds vaguely interesting and then go in and just say, can we do anything with this? And then we get our people to go to their people and they come back and say, what are you talking about, you fool? You can't do that. <laughs> However, you could do this. And so basically, it, we, we just, it's an amazing resource and, and we have like quarterly conferences and every conference, somebody from one department or other, whether it's a neurologist or a paediatrician or a member of senior nursing staff or whoever, somebody will come in and just tell us something that is guaranteed always amazing about the way they work and, and the challenges they face. Uh, and basically, we just suck all of that up and, and get as much out of it as we can. And obviously, we're, we're kind of, we have to apply it to a model where we can't show the NHS in all its kind of, uh, well, we can, it, it can't be as kind of relentless as I'm sure a lot of work is on the ground for people working in the NHS, but we do our best to fight the corner for the NHS and to, to kind of dramatise the challenges facing professionals on a daily basis within it. So, Morris, would you um, add something to Joe's commentary? Because you've worked on, as a writer, on Holby and... Uh, yeah, I, I've um, worked on both of those sh um, shows. Um, and I did two episodes of Casualty and one of Holby. And I think from um, my perspective, as uh, being a member of a, a profession that is uh, shown in the, in the programme, it, it was a bit difficult because as you would um, understand, you see things as a nurse and the script teams and the producers, because those aren't my characters. Though all those characters on all of those shows belong to the production. So it would be Joe and, and his team who are saying, these are the characters and these are their, their big stories. And you as a writer, as a, as a guest writer on that, that show, you go along and you say, right, I want to do uh, these types of stories. Um, and you, you come, you still come with three, is it, Joe? That you, yeah. You go with, yeah, you still come with three stories that you, you might think, you know, when you see, say, on Casualty, you know, a, a child in a house with a, a pan of boiling water or whatever it is, and then the audience like to kind of guess what's, what's going to happen with that. So as a writer, as a, as a job and writer on one of those shows, you come with your own, your, your own ideas. But as my other background as a nurse, it was sometimes difficult because you would have to... Um, pay attention to the researcher and to the, the professionals who said, this is the way we want to do the story. So it was fraught with difficulties at times. For me as an individual, I probably would have been better off doing the bill. You know, not, <laughs> not, not about police. I always preferred uh, a bloke climbing up into a hayloft with a, with a lit cigar to find his daughter having it off with the local the peasants. I've not seen that. Charles with water. I'm waiting for it. I'm still waiting for it to happen. So... Tim, would you like to comment about, um, as, as a, um, a medical professional, uh, about the dramas that populate our screens, which depict your, your own work, or maybe not your own particular yeah. um, expertise, but the general profession that you were involved with? Well, I think what's interesting about this is that I, th I thought a bit of if I was going to come tonight to watch a few episodes of Holby, <laughs> um, because you'll find that a lot of medics don't watch these kind of shows because, you know, they're not documentaries, are they? They're not meant to be documentaries. No. And so if you work as I do as a surgeon, you know, you can't... I guess you make them as realistic as you can to be entertaining. And I'm, I'm sort of aware of that. I was thinking that driving here that... For us, you know, a lot of what we do is just routine and 
a day at work, but for the people we look after, it's very significant. And you know, there is there is drama in hospitals. That's why people love these programs. But I, I would I would hope that the public watching Holby don't think that that's what the NHS is like, because certainly a lot of the way the professionals behave would not be acceptable. You know, if the way some of the doctors behaved on Holby actually happened, they would not survive. They certainly wouldn't survive in my service. They'd lose their jobs. So you know what I mean? It's realistic yeah, to a point. Yeah. It's, but it's not a documentary. It's entertaining. And it's very entertaining, by the way. I watched about three, ep three episodes today, and I thought it's pretty entertaining. Of the recent series? Yeah. Already. But it's not... You know, it's... it's I mean, can I give a specific example just to, to illustrate things? You know, you, there's one episode that had a, coron had a coroner's court um, in it. And I've been involved in that. And they are highly emotive and highly dramatic and can be quite confrontational for the doctors and surgeons involved. No doubt about that. But they're not like it was portrayed on your show, you know. And the way that surgeons behave in the operating theatre just does not happen. But that doesn't mean to say that operating theatres don't have tension and don't have interpersonal, mm -hmm. you know, things going on. Because that's, but they're not like it is on the show. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, you yeah. Know, yeah. It's, it's, it's entertainment, isn't it? If it was just like watching me do a four hour operation, it'd be pretty tedious, to be honest. Sharon, would you like to? Yeah, I, saw, um, I sort of echo what, what, what Tim says really well. I came with a script because I was with Rangers, <laughs> so I'm going to read my script. So, um, very similar to what you said, um, there's got to be that balance between traumatisation versus um, realism, really, hasn't there? Um, so, for a public <coughs> um, perspective about the drama storyline, you get gripped and you, you want to watch it, and I think that, for me, is first and foremost. Yeah. And I think anything regarding health then comes sort of second. It's a bonus, isn't it? You know, anything that's current, um, that the public knowledge needs awareness of. So, things like maybe uh, dementia or young, young men with um, suicide and things like that. So, that's really, really good. The second point I want to make is sometimes um, reality within the storylines can become blurred a, a little bit. Um, more often than not, the public can separate um, fact from fiction. Um, but I am aware sometimes they do think that the show is um, a representation of the NHS, in, in my experience. Um, and therefore, when they have a hospital visit or, or they, they may be an inpatient, I do think they think that that's what their expectations are from maybe the TV. That's my, mm -hmm. my understanding. And uh, just as a general sort of uh, comment about the series, it began in 1999, so it's been running a long time. Um, it was set up by a producer who had uh, been at Mersey Television and made many, many episodes of Brookside, that's Mal Young, a uh, producer who had worked both with Joe and Morris, I think, when he was at Mersey Television. Uh, it's obviously won over the years many awards. It's been going for uh, many, many episodes. It has a whole team of, of medical uh, specialists that advise uh, on for the directors and the writers. But I wanted just to uh, pick up this theme of um, whether a drama like Holby contributes to our general understanding and awareness of, of, the, me of the medical profession and of the NHS, or does it cloud our impression of it uh, and I'd kind of like to go back to Joe to start this sort of sort of theme because as a writer he, he's writing dramas he's not a documentarian trying to give an accurate depiction of, of life he's uh, he, he writes for other series he writes movies uh, in fact we, we hope that one of his scripts will be made into a movie next year by Hurricane Films so his kind of that language is, is, is a dramatic and an entertaining one. So um, what's your take on uh, what we could call like the, the purpose or the role of medical dramas? Does it enhance our awareness or do you think uh, it's our awareness? I think anyone looking at the surgical scenes in Holby would be put off ever consenting to surgery again in their life. Because I, I mean, I've written a lot of episodes, so... I mean, I've had battles recently with people saying, I'm so bored with these bleeds. Everyone's always bleeding. And, and I, I, I mean, I don't know how many bleeds you have that cause panic on a kind of monthly basis, but in Holby, it's three times, 
three times a week. Uh, it, it, it's a constant battle. But uh, the difference between us and casualty is that we are, uh, well, it's elective surgery and also we're far more focused on the serial journeys of the characters, so of, the, of our regular characters, our doctors and nurses. So basically, we're in a position where we're constantly ramping up all their stuff. And the amount, one of the main problems, you know you're saying about behaviour in theatre, is that you've got a scene to play out between two characters, but you've got a theatre team in there. So your characters have to pretend they say things to each other that, you know, they're saying stuff that they'd never say in front of other people. <laughs> so you're kind of constantly struggling with those kind of things while, while sort of incorporating the medical action, really. So it's, I, I just, an ongoing battle it is to, to, to so, you know, we've got, we've got people who are red on the detail, so prosthetics are great. Uh, our experts will tell us how far we can push it, but but like you were saying before, it's 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 like the be the actual behaviour of the the doctors is not how I would imagine it is in the real world. Can I ask a question though, Joe? Do your experts how much input do they have into those interactions and how the professionals actually behave? Not just the technical stuff, but how the professionals actually behave with patients in the operating theatre, do they give you advice about that or is that automatic uh, licence? A, a, a lot of it is licence, yeah. uh, only, only if it's something really out of the ordinary, but I think there may be a case for saying that because a lot of them have been with us a long time, they become a bit inured to it also, so like yeah. they just kind of let us get away with that, as long as we don't have somebody carving someone up with the wrong gear. I think they, they tend to uh, they, they, they tend to let us they they, they give us a bit of poetic analysis. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you know it's it's a battle that those of us who've been with the show for a long time completely recognise. But there's no real cause because really, you know, a kind of dry political version of the show. We the audience would have yeah, overnight. It would. So so yeah. we're kind of. If it was a documentary. I'm about series, to, yeah. I'm it? about to go to a conference next week, at which I'm going to tell them there is no romance in the program, no sex, no lust, no love, no nothing at the moment, and in, in stuff that hasn't been on screen yet, because because they've actually gone down the route of too many research projects. When, when you I've, say a script, sorry, when you say a conference, you mean a script conference? Yeah. 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 Not an academic. Uh, conference, yeah. I mean, just as an aside, I, I've been involved in documentaries and I was involved in the children's hospital documentary. Uh, I, I was, did an episode of that and I, had a, I do very little media work because I, you know, I like to have editorial control and that just doesn't work for most. I get asked to do quite a lot of things and I just say I'm not going to do it unless I have editorial control, which you never get. But the children's hospital, which was very sick, and these things get huge audiences, you know. Um, the episode of that that I did... I had a bit of a battle with the director there who wanted to up the drama of it quite a bit, mm. you know, and I mm. just said, look, it's not, that just doesn't work for me, you know, I won't go specifically, but it just, and that, that was a documentary, and of course they just wanted the, you know, the money shot of the child crying or the, you know, all this kind of stuff, and I, you know, it made me a bit uncomfortable towards the end, and yeah, and that was a documentary. Well, so, yeah. Good on you for sticking yeah. to your guns. Because it was a documentary. Because yeah. they were manufacturing the emotion. They would, yeah, not, not, it, was all, it was very well done, actually, and I was very pleased when it, uh, the way it was presented and the way it was shown. Um, but it certainly, you know, because it, it's got to be interesting, hasn't it? And that's, it's, it's, it's got to be interesting. As you said, if you do a dry, mm. you know, day at work, you're not going to get five million people watching it. Mm -hmm. it's no. yeah. Unless it's on Channel 5. <laughs> I, think also, I think also, um, uh, as a writer, depending on which show you, you're working on, if you're working on a, a medical show, then you know you're going to be challenged on making sure that the drama's right. And I think if, if you, you, your goal is to try and educate the public on a specific condition, then probably medical drama is not the thing that you should be doing because you know you're going to have to compromise always going to have to compromise for the drama. You try and get us factually correct because the research is there. And then as Joe says, what the, what the, uh, the producers will say is, well, how far can we actually go um, to the truth? 
So, um, as I say, to go back to it, um, when I was working on, on one of those shows, <laughs> in the end I kept on saying, this wouldn't work, they wouldn't do that. Because I'd been on, on the wards and I'd seen all these things. And in the end he just told me, just write the effing drama, will you? That's what they actually told me. So I did, I just wrote the effing drama. Yeah. But, but um, I, you know, in this discussion of documentaries uh, as opposed to fiction, um, do you feel that um, drama can introduce themes that the reality of documentary may not allow? Because obviously when people watch a documentary, there's a sense of you're seeing the real thing. Whereas dramas can take you anywhere. They, they can introduce lots of different themes. So do you think with you know, a series like Holby or other medical dramas that because they're dramas, they can tackle things that you wouldn't get uh, in a documentary, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think you, because of the nature of drama, you're actually privy to um, private conversations. Generally, in, in a documentary, it's, it's the work and the relationship between the doctor and the patient or the nurse and the patient. But the things that, you, that we do in drama is you, you go off to the, the cafe or for these personal uh, relationships for those to be uh, followed. And you can get, if, if you're doing it well, you can get the, the, the pressures on the, on the staff of what they're doing. So you can get an insight into their job, uh, which may be just slightly different than the uh, uh, documentary. I don't know how you, you felt about doing it. <laughs> Yeah, it depends how it's done, you know. Um, I'm not sure the I'm not sure the how I could answer that if I'm quite honest with you. I don't think something like Holby's there to educate, is it? I don't know what you feel about that, Joe. It's not no, your that's no. not what you're trying to do, is it? Really? No, it's not. I mean, you know, because of the way the BBC is, uh, anyway, with, it's obsessed with balance, uh, and I know it's a public uh, corporation, so it should be balanced, but. You know, you don't find that many people on a certain side of the argument. Generally, mm. the room's filled with people who are all. I guess you can let's, raise, let's you know, you can raise, <laughs> just like um, you can raise difficult issues and, you know, bring certain, as you said, there's a lot of, and it's clear that you do deal with current topical medical mm. issues that are in the papers, but. I'm not sure how educational it is. I don't, I don't well, see no, that's the no, role I, of it. It's I, there, I set it, I mean, it's every to, time... It's yeah. entertainment, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Every, I sit down and set out to entertain. Yeah. If you can inform alongside that, that's a bonus. Yeah. Really, yeah. yeah. But I suppose I meant the issues that may not be... Uh, like, like, there's often issues brought up about uh, funding in the NHS, etc., um, which might be perhaps at times provocative and which... The license of fiction allows um, the, the writer to kind of bring some different argument here, yeah. mm. which you might not get in a documentary. But if you don't humanise it, no one will be interested. So you've yeah, got to find a way I to mean, express actually, th the story through. I thought that was done very well, actually. I think that was one, one area that I really did feel a connection with the drama, because that's something we face on a daily basis, you know, lack of nursing staff just lack of everything, actually. And that is, that's the biggest problem at the moment with the National Health Service, just the lack of staff, medical and nursing staff. It's, not, it's a myth. It's not a lack of beds. It's a lack of staff. We've got plenty of beds. We just haven't got people to look after patients. And I thought that was done very well. And, done, and that does create real tensions amongst mm -hmm. team. We must see this all the time. Yeah. And you know, all, the, all the panel who do this for a living will, will recognise that. And that, you know, emotions run high about that sort of thing. <coughs> in hospitals because in the real world you are prioritising who gets care, who mm -hmm. gets care and I thought that was done very well you know, yeah. mm -hmm. is, is that something you, you, would, you tend to agree with Tim yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely 100% yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to touch upon um, professional identity because some of the programmes traditionally look at you know um, it's, all, it's always the doctor telling the nurse what to do and things like that and currently today that's not the case so some of the stuff is sometimes, for me, historic. So, you know, it needs to be probably brought into the, yeah. into the current. Yeah. I don't know what other people think about that. But the, um, within, within the institution of the BBC and in developing the shows that you do, um, are you facing a pressure to uh, respond with ratings catchers? Because the 
the, the position of a programme like Holby City is it's a prime time. It's, it's garnering, is it nine to ten million regular? No, five. Oh, five it's gone. Million, okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, nothing much gets nine to ten million these days. It's but, but do you find that they are putting pressure on you to come up with uh, either more dramatic storylines? You mentioned the, the bleeding episode, so there's, there's well, often that scene uh, no, where I, you're in the it's just that there's not, you know, you kind of, at times, people run out of things to go wrong in theatre. And, and my view is we should have a lot of operations going, just going, just happening, and we can play out a bit of dramatic tension between uh, a consultant and, a, and a, a registrar or whatever you want over the table, just play out their personal stuff. But you don't have to like nearly kill every patient, you know. I mean, I bang on about this all the time because I've written, as I said, I've written a lot of it. You've got to write three guest stories every week. You can't have every guest patient nearly dying. It's ludicrous, you know. So, so you know, and, and I think it's almost like it creates what I'd say was fake tension, basically. Where it's oh, it might sound dangerous for a minute, but I'm convinced all five million people are at home going, oh, God, I'm not another bleed. Well, you know, oh, oh, he's not going to snuff it, is he? Because they're just going to ch- they're going to ch- charge the pads and shock him in a minute. So, I think you've got to be a bit more selective and. And you can get drama out of the guest stories and the regular stories without resorting to that all the time. Uh, but I would say, though, that we're not... We don't go down the sensationalist route, particularly, I don't think, compared to... Well, there's not overt pressure put on us to do so. You know, we try to come up with big stories, but we want stories that last. Mm. Like, we've got a big one coming up, which is basically... Uh, a big long running research project with, 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 with like a stem cell thing uh, that, that hopefully will, will run for six, nine months uh, with you know, lots of ups and downs and people questioning the motives of people and the rest of it. But we'll have to see, see what pans out. But you know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't say that we're, we're forced to sensationalise. The people who were, like Kate Hall, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, is is a very sound person and just she's she's got a you know she's got her own sort of values and the rest of it and that's not her bag just ah oh, just layer it lash it all in you know so yeah I think um, working on other shows on on commercial channels um, the pressure when we used to go to these storyline meetings you'd meet once a month on other shows. And the producer would come in, and then he'd have the overnight figures. Well, what was, uh, how many millions were watching the show, or how many millions weren't? Because there's ad- adverts, and basically, you know, we could say, as we're dramatists, but um, if you work for a commercial channel, you're trying to make sure that that channel can um, and that program can sell adverts. So there was a greater pressure on um, on the writers working on a commercial channel. So, and when they used to have A and E, which was another. Um, um, medical show on, on Granada, I think it was, or on ITV, that, that in the end just failed because it couldn't, it couldn't get the ratings. As soon as the ratings start to fall on the commercial channel, the producers are in trouble because there's somebody above them saying, you've got to change your stories and your style of stories. So there's a greater pressure on you there. On TV we have, uh, as Morris mentioned, a, there's been A&E, there's Casualty, there's Holby, there's, uh, there's Doctors, which is the daytime um, medical drama. We've got dramas um, coming over from the States. Um, yeah. uh, ER was a big groundbreaker at the time. Do, do you think the sort of um, almost uh, sort of over, uh, overwhelming presence of medical dramas on TV deprofessionalizes the medical profession because it's <coughs> everywhere on, on the channels? Does it take something of the... Uh, does it sort of take uh, a little bit of the, uh, the kind of aura of the expert away by focusing in on um, all the specialists and consultants that, that, that populate all these shows? I don't think so, no. And I think now the public have got use, got um, IT, they can go on all sorts of, to get information anyway. So I think the public are more aware of, of um, issues yeah. now, regardless of whether they're on the, the dramatised yeah. channel. I agree with that because 
I mean, everyone's got experience of seeing doctors and seeing nurses, so they, I think people can separate what they've seen in their own personal lives with seeing what they're seeing on TV and in movies. I mean, I think the public are smart enough to recognise that it's drama, yeah. you know. Um, the time I get more frustrated is when things that are actually dressed up as documentaries and factual are incorrect. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I find more difficult, because I think that if you watch a documentary, you would assume that it was credible and it was factually accurate, which is certainly not always the case. And that's what I find. With something like Holby City and Casualty, people know their dramatisations. I mean, they know that this stuff just doesn't happen every week in a hospital, you know. Um, yeah. Can I ask something? Do you think that then, as a follow-on to that, is Google generally a force for bad or good? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too much it was, it it I think it's. I think. I think it's a force. Do you mean patients getting inf internet? Patients off the internet. Yeah, information off the internet. Yeah, yeah. I think it's generally a force for good. Yeah. I think that information is good, and patients. Pretty much everyone I see has been on the internet and researched their healthcare issues, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, I mean, the, the internet's like the Wild West, isn't it? There's a lot of good stuff and there's a lot of crazy stuff. But you, people are smart enough generally to recognise that, I think. You know? And uh, I think where we are now compared to where we were when I started is a much better place. A much better place. So, yeah. I'd like to throw it open to the floor for some questions from um, the assembled... In front. There's, um, so if you can indicate you've got a question, just let me know. So there's one... To start with, there's one there and then one behind. So I don't think we've got any road and mics, Derek. So if you can. Um, I was interested in what you were saying, Joe, about the false tension. And um, we've got quite a few of our screenwriting students here tonight. Um, and it, tension is obviously something we talk about a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, it's also really a question for Morris as well, but within your experience, how, how do you get to that true tension? You know, what, you know, what, are, the, what are the, you know, you know what, what are the things that guide you into the true tension rather than ending up with that false imposed sense of uh, I think generally, if the story feels really, if there's some essential truth at the heart of the story, you'll, you'll find tension in that. I mean, that, that clip, which might have seemed a bit random, but uh, basically the old woman with the, her arm in a sling was Serena, the, the surgeon's mum, and she was drifting into d dementia, and that was part of her ongoing story. And that was one of the, for me, that was one of the best stories we did across a number of weeks and months, because we, she was in and out of hospital, kind of doing damage to herself, trying to still live at home with Serena kind of sandwiched between work and chasing up looking after her and constantly having to bring her in and then parking her in her office for half a day because there was nowhere else for her to go because there was no one else for her to look after her. Uh, so, and, and within that, just in the sort of humdrum moments where Serena had come in and find her mum on her computer, like fiddling around, losing stuff uh, there was massive tension in that because it was just it felt like an honest story uh, and I think you know the best guest stories are I just like to keep things very simple really you can get a lot out of someone just fretting about you know people's everyday concerns but just made writ, just writ large because they're also ill so you know as opposed to get the paddles out shock <laughs> And then you know they're going to be all right in a minute. The only tension is, will they actually die? Will they be the one in 20 who actually dies? Because we're not allowed to kill that many people because <laughs> they, they don't like that. They don't like us killing <laughs> you've got to re You've got to earn killing people. But you, don't have, you don't have to earn a bleed in every, in every operation. So I think, yeah, just something that is essentially true, will ha you'll find some sort of tension in there. It's just got to feel like it counts, you know. Yeah, I think um, it, it, 
depends on, on what you're writing. But if, you, if, you, if you're writing one of these um, high, high volume shows when you've got lots and lots of episodes uh, throughout the year, then you are going to, uh, at times, and I've been told by producers to, you know, hook out of every single scene. And as a writer, you're just looking for what is the, the hook on, on this particular scene, because in particular when you get to it, like an end of part one, you want the audience to come back after the adverts for cars and the rest of it. So you're constantly straining for, and it sometimes does feel, as Joe says, like a false hook on a scene. But when you're writing a, a film or you know a 90 minute a 90 minute drama and you're following one character or a couple of characters, it should be easier there, provided that on every single scene there's there's a point of conflict, and then you're still ending the scene where the where the viewer is thinking, I want to see what happens next. But then it does. It shouldn't feel false in the film. There's guy then white, two rows behind. Yeah, uh, Joe Morris, uh, one of Derry's uh, scriptwriting students. I was just so wondering, in, in relation to writing uh, uh, an ongoing TV show like Holby City and the likes, um, what what, uh, what sort of methods would you like to sort of suggest or implement in, in relation to uh, not only uh, writing and keeping the episodes uh, uh, obviously done in the allotted time, but um, in terms of like, as you were saying, like, including relevant situations within like current news and such like that, and, and making sure that that relevance remains throughout the episodes that you write. Do you want to go first? Yeah, you go. Want me to? You go first. I, I, I think um, the the whole point about the relevance. I mean, Joe. When, when Joe was asked right at the beginning how he goes about it, is to um, like go through the papers, see what is relevant now in a long running show. You need to um, be really putting the mirror up to the to the audience and saying this might be a part of your life. The stuff that we're writing about now, and depending on the, the type of show that you, that you are actually writing, you know your producers will tell you how far you can go with that particular thing. But relevance for me means always listening to um, conversations on a bus, always listening to people that I work with and seeing what their concerns are. So in a way, really, I. I Hopefully, don't run out of story because there are so many things that, that wind me up, as it does for most writers, I think. You get buses, Morris. <laughs> <Still, laughs> My show for a week, I'll There's a question there, uh, uh, and then one further back. So, Lady Perth. Yeah. Um, I'm just interested in the new technologies and new procedures that come out of Holby City, and how are they based on current research? Thinking of writing recent stories, I'm Sasha Lee and Vivian Saints, Marshall and Kate. I've Googled it, can't find it anywhere. <laughs> so I'm just wondering how much is based on actual procedures and plans. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, that is one area where we, it's really difficult because if we have our characters invented something, the big question is why hasn't a real surgeon already invented this? So it's like, it's quite hard to actually be cleverer than the actual people who know what they're talking about. <laughs> so what we tend to do is uh, we get our experts to go, this is where it's all going. This is where we think it's going. This is what we're working on. This is what is still in the lab. I remember years ago, I mean, there have been times in the show where it has been extremely not believable uh, in the past period. Because these things are cyclical, different people take over. And there are times where it's just kind of gets a bit daft and, and sometimes they just focus totally on the personal stories and it might as well not be in a hospital, you know. But, but they're, they're brief periods and we usually move on from them. But we had like stuff with... Uh, I remember pig's kidneys was one where we had like a pig kidney transplant, I think it was, or something like that. It was a long time ago, so bear with me. Now, my, my mother-in-law has got a pig's valve in her heart, so... But I think that at the time, because this is like about 2006, I'm not sure, you might correct me on this, but I think it, there was some sort of cutting edge thing going on with something to do with pigs, kidneys, I can't remember. But you know, we, we, we ask people to tell us where we can get to without actually seeming ludicrous, but possibly going beyond people who watched it googling it so it just, there's like a sort of middle ground between those between the insane and the actual factual and where we often operate in that hinterland or whatever so do that question yeah. 
So, uh, observation and a question. Uh, it strikes me, because I watch quite a few of these before coming, it strikes me the big risk I get from the show of medical professionals is STIs more than anything else, really. Um, and, and the question was, um, watching it, it struck me, because I, I watch quite a few, and, and this is both medical professions and, and, and the, the writers, it kind of almost feels like the shows represent the class structure we have in the country, because I know you have to deal with the kind of typical character archetypes, I'm, I'm kind of curious for the writers and the medical professions, is it kind of you know, happy working class characters are the nurses and so on, and then it's the upper classes who are the consultants, is that the reality of, of our hospital? Because it kind of feels like that sometimes, watching these shows. I think that was the point I was making mm -hmm. before about professional identity. <laughs> And I, in my experience, know it isn't. It's not the reality of it. I don't know what term it is. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still pretty hierarchical. I can't pretend it isn't, you know. I mean, I'm not... I, I don't think it's quite like Holby, but it, there's no doubt that there are differences. You know, I think consultant surgeons are, you know, different sometimes. So I, th I don't think it's quite like that, but yeah. there is, um, yeah, I think the relationships between the, d the senior and the junior doctors, if I'm honest, are not as they're portrayed mm -hmm. in Holby, you know, as somebody who runs a team of trainees and surgeons. Um, but those tensions do exist. They do exist, yeah. Um, some of them are a little bit caricatured, you know, the one of the consultant surgeons I was watching, you know, you just, you don't see characters like that now, really. But you did. No doubt you, no, no doubt that you did. It's not so you, quite like that. You mean it's a bit of a retrogressive depiction? Yeah, I think so, you know. It's not, yeah. Uh, would you say that was behaviourally or actually that there is more of a spread of surgeons from... Uh, for want of a better phrase, more ordinary backgrounds? Well, I think it's quite generational. I mean, certainly when I started, I've been doing surgery for 20-odd years, there were hardly any women doing surgery. And uh, when I went to medical school, 100 students, I was one of about three who didn't have a private education. You know, so yeah. that that's a fact. And there's still, I don't know what the figures are now, but if you looked at consultant surgeons. I mean, what's interesting, in our specialty, and I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon, more than half of our trainees are, are women now. Over half are women. Mm -hmm. When I started, it was, there were hardly any women surgeons. So the world is changing, and it has changed. Um, and the sort of, some of the caricatures of, you know, the Sir Lancelot type yeah. surgeon, they don't really exist now. Those characters are dying out. But yeah, I, can't, I, don't, I, can't, I mean, I don't think we have that many yeah. Sir Lancelot's in Holby. No. Uh, in fact, we had we featured one for a short time just to kind of illustrate the way that you that do, person is a bit of a dinosaur. You, so, you, you know? certainly get... I've got colleagues who will not let people you call them by their first name, mm. you know, which is the most bizarre thing yeah. in the profession, you know, that I've got colleagues who say it's, it's Mr So-and-so, yeah. it's Professor So-and-so to you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, that's I mean, another of my, like, yeah. small bugbears, yeah. is that I, you know, in my experience, knowing various people who work at various levels in the, in the medical profession, most of them do just call each other by their Christian names. Yeah. Uh, having said that, I actually, my personal view is that, you know, you, the thing about private education, I think, still stands I mean, to most people are pretty no, Most degree. people are pretty normal. You know, I mean that's but that's not a, that's not that interesting. So you've yeah. got to you've yeah. got to you've got to portray the the odd person mm. who isn't that to make it interesting, haven't you? Yeah. Else you wouldn't have a. But it's like we've got we've got a, a senior nurse <laughs> and a consultant, and she's living in his house with her kid. But there was an episode the other day where she was calling him Mister Griffin, and I was like, "What are they doing <laughs> this for? She's, <laughs> ma she's making his tea." Yeah. <laughs> Not that that's in any way uh, I make my stereotypical. <laughs> she was, I make all the teas. I make my wife call me professor. Is <laughs> 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 that just a certain key moments of the day? <laughs> yeah. yeah. More questions? 
Yes. I I got a question. And it, it kind of goes back to that kind of professional identity, really, and the diversity within. And I mean, obviously, we're talking about Hobby and, and casualty and other sports. There's been other uh, medical dramas, the Royal, uh, and other that have had some historical context. And of course, the Call of Midwife was one of those, isn't it? But I think, look, certainly looking at more contemporary dramas, there isn't necessarily always that diversity of understanding of actually what engagement patients would have. Granted, they are fictional patients. What actual fiction, uh, what patients engagement would have in NHS services? Now, obviously, I, I, I'm a, you know uh, probably not in the best position. I'm a learning disability, then. so I work with predominantly with, with people who are a relatively small population uh, in terms of the general population. Relatively small population, certainly within hospital services such as Patricia and Casualty and Holby, but actually in terms of level of complexity, actually it may may be quite significant in relation to how that, but. And that's just me, that's just me talking as an LD nurse, but I think there is, as you say, there is that, that, that lack of diversity around understanding the roles, even just in the medics and nurses, and obviously you've got a medic and a nurse on your panel, that sometimes that diversity doesn't come through. Mm. Um, and, and maybe that's because it's, it's a drama. Um, going back to the Google, I mean, I, I, the Google patients, as I, as I call them, um, I think so, and I agree, I think information is king, uh, and certainly I would support a lot of my patients who have a lot of uh, families around get, gaining information, but actually, um, Google can be dramatic. Mm. Google can be a drama in itself, in terms of the information that's available to people. I'm, I'm not talking about the documentary stuff, I'm not talking about YouTube or Holby or Casualty or Bruce said mm. but actually some of the information that's shared is actually quite dramatic and, and, and quite fictional. Mm. Uh, even some of the research, if you, yeah. so if you read some of the stuff. Um, but, but I was wondering how, how you guys kind of try and capture some of that diversity in, in the profession. Because obviously your patients are diverse. As you said, you're three guest mm -hmm. patients per week. So how do you try and capture that? Because not all of your core characters will have some of the skills that will be expected to be in place to support those patients. And a, a great example is, is the, the um, one we just seen about the gentleman who, I'm assuming, potentially, and it is a stereotype, Possibly a veteran, possibly some mental health issues going on, and and, and by the looks of it, a potential for, for um, to have an accident where he's, he's injured himself. Right? But in reality, you have much more than the consultant, the general nurse, the adult nurse. You have a you have a team around you to support you with that. And sometimes that's not portrayed. No, no, it's it's very difficult to strike that balance because we've got a very limited number in the cast. And, and I feel that it's too consultant heavy. There are times where everyone's an expert. We've got, there are, there are times where we have to run a story with no nurse in the story, which I always think is, you know, ideally what you want is a nurse, an F1 or a registrar, and a consultant. I mean, the big lie about the show is the amount of time the consultants spend with the patients, so with them having spent a lot of time in and out of hospitals with the own parents, you know, your consultant is that you, that's the golden hour. You've got to be there when the consultant is coming and get make sure what he is there to ask the questions because that kid doesn't know anything. <laughs> you know, you always that's what that's the kind of family attitude, isn't it, of, of a patient's family going, oh, you've got to get a, you've got to get the top dog. Uh, but the show just simply cannot function like that. We need these high status characters who literally walk the wards for eight hours and are always available for some bit of drama somewhere. So I hold my hands up and say it's 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 not it's not real. You know, in t in in those terms it we cannot portray that reality otherwise basically it'd be HCAs, nurses and and some junior doctors, wouldn't it? You know. And and, and our consultants would come in to do the, the sort of Big decisions, but we we need them there all the time. So, yeah, that's an honest answer. <laughs> Question there. Yep.
to um, run down the NHS, um, and that that's driven by an underlying political agenda to undermine it and drive us towards privatisation. I'd, so uh, I'd, in my ex yeah. In my experience working with whole different teams year in, year out, through about four or five cycles of, of doing Holby, and my experience prior to that of, of just the structures of the BBC and prevalent attitudes of the rest of it, I'd, I'd, I'd say that is completely understandable given the climate, but actually totally uh, uh, a misguided view. It's, it's not like that at all. Uh, what the BBC is, is an is a organisation very similar to the NHS in that it relies on public funding and is under constant attack. In fact, I'd say the NHS is under less attack from the public than the BBC. You know, you, you know, your Daily Mail reader will complain about the licence fee to, till the cows come home, but then complain about the programmes when the licence fee gets capped and the programmes are crap because we haven't got the money to make decent programmes. You know, it's like some sort of, you know, it's some complete vicious uh, circle kind of thing. So, no, I'd, I'd say that we generally try to uh, illustrate as best we can and humanise the prevalent issues uh, of the day uh, and that the last thing we're... If you look at the, if you examine the show, there's very little private health in it. Uh, you know, within you know the structure of, of the hospital, and when we do do it, we tend to do it, and the private health goes wrong, and the NHS wins. So we're all, we're always kind of leaning in that direction. Uh, you know, the, the BBC's you know fighting, scared of of a string of you know the who was that idiot culture minister that was. In about two or three years ago, they're always non-entities anyway. But whichever one it was, he basically someone said to him, "Oh, would you like to scrap the license fee and just let the BBC go private?" And his answer was to rub his chin and go, "Hmm, tempting." Mm. Well, you know, you know, we're, we're, you, they're up against a lot. And my view is that people should basically be standing on a big box and shouting, "This is the best public broadcasting corporation in the world." In the same way as people should be standing on a big box and saying, "This is the best health service in the world," you know. So, so I, I, I actually see them as really kind of brother and sister in a way. They're the two great institutions of of the country, really. Uh, no, because we're constantly being, because you can't be. Uh, explicit in that. And I, I can only speak for myself. Uh, it's the 70th anniversary of the NHS in a few months. I'm doing the 70th anniversary episode. I'm hoping to represent what it all stands for. If anyone's got any contributions, please feel free to email me with them and I can, I'll get them in. But, uh, mm. yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 I feel... Because I think that's interesting, Joe, actually. Can I, could, I yeah. feel I must come in here because I... You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the NHS. It's not the best health service in the world, by the way. That's a myth. It's just not. It's completely underfunded compared to other health services. We're way behind a lot of health care provision in other developed countries. But let's not get into that. Um, the one thing I felt watching episodes of Holby City is that sometimes it did feel to me that you were trying to portray the NHS as you'd like it to be, not how it yeah, is. I'd agree. Because people do not go, come in with their bowel problem, go to theatre in an hour. They just yeah. don't. You know, it doesn't happen. And it doesn't really get across the... It did, some of the issues are the difficulties, but it's, the NHS is far less efficient and far more troublesome and far more troubled than is portrayed in that drama. Yeah. So in some ways, there was times when I watched some of the episodes I watched that I felt... I know you do deal with some of the problems, but... You know, it did feel almost a little bit political to me, if I'm honest. That yeah, it, well, but, I, but I agree with that. I mean, yeah. my, you know, I think that what should be, we should be illustrating what's wrong with it through those very stories right. rather than 
project a utopian version of it. That's very frustrating. But I think that goes across the board with the BBC for, for kind of uh, story issues of, of uh, race, gender, anything, any big... They, they, I think there is a problem with trying to present a world that is balanced. Yeah. And, and I actually, if you look at American TV, particularly in its treatment of, uh, of, of sort of ethnicity, I think you'll find a lot more honesty and a lot more people speaking frankly and speaking in a language that actually exists in the real world. But we're on at eight o'clock at night, so we don't get to use any of that stuff, which is a constant difficulty. But I don't, I, I agree with that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you know, picking up your point on, on the reality of, um, you know, starving something of funds and then show that it doesn't work and then the best solution to, to that is to privatise it and lots of people would, uh, would agree with that and lots of people analyse the situation like that. To try and get that kind of a, of a drama on television, particularly on, on the BBC, you know, you are really fighting. Channel 4, you might have a chance, but most of the other channels just, they're not really that interested. You might get a, a play on it, you can go to a theatre with it, because it's your personal view and it's hard that, to make that's that, all right. It's hard to make that entertaining though, isn't yeah. it? Mm. Well, you, well, you can, I mean, I suppose that, that's, the, that's the trick of the writer to yeah. be able to do that. Is it? Okay. Yeah, it has been done before. You know, be Joe Brand's series, you know, which was about how difficult it was on um, um, BBC, uh, BBC Four. You know, that was just a bit harsh and a bit, you know, so you can do it. That's yeah, you can, but Three Men and a Dog watch that. I loved yeah, it. Yeah. But, like, that is not... Yeah, that, well, you, exactly. you, you know, you've got kind of all these different niches and all these boxes you've got to tick. Mm. If Holby doesn't pull in it, mm. you know, the audience dropped to mm. two million from five mm. over a couple of months, mm. I've no doubt that they'd be under pressure, mm. you know. It's... Yeah. it's uh, mm. But just uh, to... To go just to talk about that sort of ministerial pressure, on just to illustrate what it's like at the Beeb, uh, there was some talk a while ago about them they should stop making programmes that are directly competing with commercial TV. So don't make Strictly because it's competing with the X Factor, or don't make The Voice because yeah. it's competing with the X Factor. Don't make Strictly because it's uh, well, it's just another competition. So so what they were saying was. We want you to make programmes that are more, much more community-based. And I'll guarantee you those programmes on a Saturday night, when everyone just wants to be entertained, would not get the audiences. So then they say, well, you're making all these programmes, you're not getting the audiences for, what's the licence fee for? The whole thing is a way of trying to get rid of the licence fee through the back door, basically. So that's the constant pressure we're under. And what you find is that people tend to, rather than defend the organisation, will tend to go on the defensive and count out to, to certain influences, you know. And I, I mean, I don't know how that... I mean, I, like, how does that play out in the NHS in terms of if Jeremy Hunt turns up to a conference, for instance, and makes a speech about... Well, I mean, I don't know. How does it, how does it work? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it works that we just get on with it. Yeah, we just yeah. get on with it, and we just do our jobs the best we can with the resources we have. Simple, you know. We've got time for one question before we wrap up. So, um, is a a hand in the front there? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a good quarter of a century since I've done clinical medicine. But one of the reasons I thought of that was I was working in A&E when Casualty first started. And really, it put me off because they were all getting it right in Casualty and I wasn't. And I couldn't understand why. Whereas other programmes such as Cardiac Arrest, Bodies, Angels, I don't know if you're, you're probably too young to remember, they were far more reflective of what was happening. I wondered how influential those programmes were. They were obviously cardiac arrest and the bodies were written by a doctor, a very good dramatist, but they really represented it far more what was going on on board. What that was, was Jed Mercurio, wasn't yeah. it? Jed Mercurio yeah. wrote those, yeah. I remember those programmes, and I, I think what it was is it was one person's voice. So the writer says, this is my vision. Could you say, you know, sometimes like, how interesting is it? One person's voice 
can make it interesting, I think. Once, once you end up with, a, with this massive machine that is a, um, a soap or twice a week drama, it then becomes very, very difficult because each, each writer who comes to it can have a different view politically. The producer, as Joe says, the producers change. The producer comes in with um, their own um, scheme, the way they want to uh, direct things. So with an individual writer, you can get to those uh, points that you, you talked about. Well, I think it's time to, to wrap up. We're, um, we've got a reception outside, so there's some refreshments for you there. Um, I'd like to thank the panel for what's been a fascinating, stimulating discussion um, coming at um, the medical dramas from the media profession and also the medical profession. Like, thank Joe, Sharon, Tim and Morris for their contributions this evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.